Well, good morning, everybody. Our reading has taken us to the book of Leviticus, and so we're going to get to spend a little bit of time there. And I enjoyed um, when Greg started this series, he shared with us that the book of Exodus that we just finished is actually known to the Jews as the book of names because of the first words that are recorded there. Um, These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. And the story of Exodus reveals how God rescued those descendants, the sons of Jacob and their children, who became known as the children of Israel. The people became a nation while they were living in slavery. And God saw their suffering. He remembered his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he chose Moses, a descendant of Levi, to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. And that's how we first learn who Moses is. He's described as a son born to a man and woman from the tribe of Levi. The names of his parents aren't recorded for us until chapter 6. And so, he is a Levite who is rescued from the river. His adoption by the royal family, he's a Levite. The murder, the running away, the living in the desert, the moment at the burning bush, the call of God to empower him to go rescue the people, all happen under the title Levite. He is a son of Levi. And is that shocking? No. Is it earth-shattering? No. Does it change how you read the book? Probably not. But when the book is called Names and focuses on the descendants of the sons of Jacob, the people of Israel, remembering that Moses is a Levite is central to understanding that he's called to lead God's people out of bondage. And so it does become important because we're invited to see one of those ongoing themes repeated in Scripture. Moses is the second-born son. The first-born son is Aaron, and he's passed over. We're invited to remember that the firstborn is cursed in Egypt. They're only protected by the blood of the Lamb. And that the firstborn were supposed to be dedicated to God. But it's the children of Levi who respond to Moses' call during that moment in the sin around the golden calf. It's the children of Levi who respond to that call and then are called priests dedicated to God. And that anointing that they receive becomes significant because of this book that we're going to spend a little bit of time in, this book of worship with its instructions on how to offer sacrifices, how to deal with sin, the breaking of the law, and how you restore the relationship with God. And Leviticus is that Greek title chosen because it deals with the duty of the priests. But for the Jews, this book is and he called. It's the story of the called. And for the last several weeks, we've been looking at passages that remind us that we are the called of God, the priests who are meant to serve in his kingdom. It's not simply that we're those who have responded to the gift of forgiveness for sin, the grace offered in Jesus, or that we're longing for eternity with God. We recognize that we are people who have accepted Jesus. We have repented of our sin. We have claimed the forgiveness of sin offered in Jesus. We've died to ourselves. We've received the Holy Spirit in baptism and that we have committed our lives to serving God, serving the cause of Christ, the risen Savior. And so we are the royal priesthood, the people called out. We are the called of God, the church of Christ. 
And so we're going to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what Leviticus has to say to us and the importance of the role that we've taken on, serving as a priest. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord, bring as your offering an animal from either the herd or the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. He must present it at the entrance of the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be acceptable on his behalf to make atonement for him. He is to slaughter the young bull before the Lord, and then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and sprinkle it against the altar on all sides at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, are to put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, including the head and the fat, on the burning wood that is on the altar." He is to wash the inner parts and the legs with water, and the priest is to burn all of it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Personally, I'm really glad that we no longer have to deal with the sacrifices at the altar. And as I read the first several chapters of the book, the thought that overwhelmed me was, that is a lot of blood. And when you multiply the number of sacrifices offered for the various offenses by the number of Israelites camped around the base of Mount Sinai for over 40 years traveling around in the desert, the only thing I can think is, man, that's a lot of blood. The altar is sprinkled by it. This tent of meeting has sort of become a blood-soaked mud mixture. The hands of the priests are covered in it. And I'm sorry, but that's the picture I see. Over and over again, I see the amount of blood spilled. And then when you magnify that by having to make sacrifices for sins you did on purpose, or how about the ones you committed accidentally? And then let's not forget the sacrifices offered because you might be unaware of a sin you committed. All I can say is, my goodness, that is a lot of blood. And while I know there is a deeper truth here, one revealed in talking about the specific kinds of sacrifices, the kinds of offerings, animal, grain, incense, the truth I see framed in the words of God spoken in Isaiah 43 are the ones that ring in my ear. The people I formed for myself that they may proclaim my praise Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves for me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not brought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. But you have burdened me with your sins." And wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Review the past for me. Let us argue the matter together. State the case for your innocence. Your first father sinned. Your spokesman rebelled against me. So I will disgrace the dignitaries of your temple and I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. Israel failed to keep the law. And perhaps worse, they failed to practice the prescribed message, method of dealing with that sin. Each of us would have to confess that we're really no different. If we were to revisit quickly the Ten Commandments, those original laws given by God, how many would you say you've broken? Now make a mental list. Which ones did you break on purpose? Which ones by accident? Which ones might you be unaware that you broke? And if we expanded those commandments to include the teaching of Jesus on the mountain, 
the ones Matthew recorded as the Sermon on the Mount? How many times have you sinned now? Have you harbored hate against someone? Looked lustfully? Boasted? Called someone a fool? On and on we could go. Jesus has told us that those are violations of the law as well. So how much blood will be needed to be poured out for the forgiveness of that sin? Now multiply it by the billions that have lived. How much blood needs to be poured out for all of that sin? And how do we deal with the cause, the root of the problem? We have wearied the Lord. It's an interesting phrase. The interesting part is we have not wearied him with our attempts to fix the problem. The passage reveals to us that we have wearied him by our lack of a desire to even try. Is that strange? I paused and reflected on that. A world determined to call sin good. That's how we fix the problem. Why deal with the problem when you can just say it doesn't exist? God is wearied by even our lack of trying. God invites humanity to present the case. He says, stand before me. Argue for your innocence. Come on. Tell God you're not guilty. Tell him that sin doesn't exist. You can't. You know you are. And so is everyone that came before you. That's what those words in Isaiah tell us. And God is justified in his weariness. He is justified in his frustration and his anger over the sin that we, that humanity, commits. And we deserve his, his scorn. I'm so glad we didn't have to stop at Isaiah 43. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jerusalem, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and will take the name Israel. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. God in his kindness, and I think this is important to see, God in his kindness, not because of us, but in his kindness is motivated out of his own identity, his own sake. That's what that phrase means. His own righteousness, his own glory, he has chosen to deal with our mess, our rebellion, our sin, and even our lack of effort. He does this by offering himself. How much blood, we asked. How much blood must be poured out to deal with our sin? The very blood of the one who created the heavens. The one through whom all things were made. The blood of the perfect lamb. The word of life. God in the flesh. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the word of life, has poured out his blood upon the eternal altar. And he has made himself the bread, the grain offering, the incense, the fragrant extravagant offering, the perfect sacrifice offered once for all. 
But our response can't simply be to revel in these words. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of sin, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. Do you like that verse? No condemnation. But we can't just rest on those words. We have to take it with the words that follow. Because in a minute we're going to take the bread and the cup and remember how loved I am. But I can't just think of that. I have to keep reading and embrace all the words I have to embrace the fullness of what it is we profess when we take the bread and the cup. And so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers... We have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We need to take the bread and the cup today and remember the sacrifice of Jesus, the sin offering that made us free. But as we take it today... I want to ask that you remember as well that we are a people who reject sin. We condemn sin. We reject its power in our lives and are committed to live by the power of the Spirit, not by the power of sin. We embrace the gift of God, His Spirit placed within us to help us, to transform us, to call us out of bondage and embrace the life offered through Jesus We have an obligation to live according to the Spirit. And so we choose to put to death sin, to die to ourselves, and to live for God. Now, I can't help it. If you did the reading this week, you'll notice that we stopped at a comma. How can you stop at a comma? That's not a period. It's a breath. There's more of that reading that we are supposed to focus on. It wasn't included in the text, but maybe you're like me and just couldn't help yourself. You had to read past that comma. Do you see it there at the end? You will live. There's still another thought. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You and I are children of God. We're the heirs of the promise. You see, our identity has been changed. Just like Moses is revealed to be a Levite. And we're supposed to key in on that reality and recognize that that is a priest of God called to serve. 
you and I have had our identity changed. We are now children of God. So we are the called of God, the adopted of God. We belong to God. We are His. And so as we take the bread and we drink the cup, we need to remember that we have put to death sin and claimed our new identity. Heirs of the promise. We are the people of God. The royal priesthood. And so we have to run after that calling and not continue to allow sin to reign in our hearts, in our minds, in our thoughts. And so as we take the bread and the cup today, remember who you are, who you belong to, and the gift that you have been given, and the obligation that you now bear to live as a child of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for the power of his blood, for the completeness of his sacrifice. We pray that as we take the bread and the cup today, that we would remember again the calling that we have received, that we are those who know the truth, who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And we pray that you would help convict our hearts that in each day we would serve you that we would seek to put to death sin in our bodies and live by the power of your Spirit to transform us and use us and help us to be the priests that you've called us to be, to serve in your kingdom, to serve the cause of Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.